Hi everyone, we're gonna wait just a few more minutes to, in case a couple more people pop on. We do have group, two groups of students out on field trips. So I think this will be a smaller, more intimate discussion for today, which is good, but it'll be recorded for all to see. All right, I do think we're gonna, like I said, have a smaller group today. I am gonna to get started because I don't see any more popping in right now. Um, and let me just, oh, Mark, can you go back to the first page? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Right. Oh, sorry. Um, so this is our last um, professional development seminar or brown bag lunch, however you wanna call it for the semester. And it's because we have just a few students, um, just want to welcome you all. Ryan, did you want to say a quick hello? Hello. <clears throat> and are you almost done classes now? Um, getting there. Good. And Alexandra, do you go by Alex or Alexandra? Alex is fine. Very good. I yeah, know we Alex talked a little, bit, a little bit earlier, so nice to have you back. Thank you. Thank you for having us. We appreciate it. Very good. And Ben? Hello. Hey. And Sage? Hello. How are you doing this morning? Very good. Good to see okay. you. I think that's it for now. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. So we, we have had these seminars and we asked the students you know, what is it you want to know? And Don helps us quite a bit of, with these because Don is the one that you interface with a lot and you come to her with questions and, and stuff. So the faculty gets together, we talk to students and we try and put together seminars that we'll find useful. But we also put together seminars where we think we feel like you don't, you might not know this stuff. Um, and this one in particular was Dr. Basquin's idea when he pointed out that many students don't know about Ful Fulbright's, which led to a bigger discussion on making sure you were aware of different research opportunities out there. So both ones on campus and ones um, off campus, like the Fulbright, which is super prestigious. So Mark, do you wanna advance the next slide? Sure. So we're just gonna to touch on some of the off-campus opportunities and some of the on-campus op opportunities. Keep in mind, these aren't exclusive lists. There are many other opportunities. A couple of the ones we're presenting on campus are actual grants, but so, some of them like um, Don is gonna to talk to us about is ones that are always there, always available for you to do. That, and I think students don't know to ask for these when they come in. So I'm, I, I think it's really important um, to share this information with you. Uh, now we're gonna go ahead and move on. Mark, you can advance it. And um, Dr. Basquin is gonna talk to you about international fellowships, specifically the Fulbright. So Mark, go ahead and take it away and I'll mute myself. Okay, great. Thank you, uh, Donna, for the introduction. Thanks for joining this. Uh, sometime back, uh, I asked uh, in my class, Faith and Transport class, uh, how many of the students know about uh, uh, Fulbright? And uh, how many students have heard from Wayne State University about the existence of this Fulbright? The university fully supports students um, and uh, make it known to the students. And uh, I was surprised um, uh, no one knew about it. And then uh, the university holds this uh, events uh, twice a year uh, about these programs, the international fellowships and uh, scholarships for students. And um, uh, with all that university trying to uh, reach out to the students, somehow it is not permeating to the, uh, 
the a large segment of the students. So this is why um, we thought this would be a good idea. This would be a good forum to reach out to our students. And uh, um, having spent some time as a senior Fulbright scholar, uh, we become ambassadors uh, for the Fulbright to advertise, uh, reach out to people and share what they can do and all that. So clearly it's in the mission of Fulbright, they expect uh, the alum to go out and bring more people to get excited about these opportunities. What is the international fellowship? Um, you get grants, scholarships, fellowship to travel, to go and explore different cultures, different countries, and you don't take a loan, you don't pay a dime, and all the reasonable expenses are completely covered through these international fellowships. What do you do when you get a scholarship? You can go and conduct some research in the area of your interest. You can get a master's degree or PhD degree. You teach English to a country where English is not a common language. So these are different things students do once they get an international scholarship or fellowship. What do you do after I finish this program? The students always ask the question. If we go and do selective programs, uh, competitive programs, when you come, come back, the whole world is opening up to you. You can do lots of different, different things. There are students who come back from, uh, for example, Fulbright. They go uh, and uh, get a master's or PhD from top tier institu institutions like um, Harvard, MIT, Princeton, Stanford type institutions. They go and work for the state departments. Um, this is a common one. Uh, you get to travel, you get to be, see different cultures, different countries do that. Lots of different things people do with this. So uh, right now I will start going into a brief uh, um, account of the scholarships that uh, uh, we have. One is the Boren Scholarship for undergraduate students. The, give $25,000 to study abroad in the areas of world critical and future security of our nation. So many scholarships, fellowships are specifically targeted to, to, towards certain things. And this modern scholarship is one of those. So one has to be a US citizen. The next one is uh, Gates Cambridge uh, Scholarship. So, the Rhodes Scholarship is a one which is in existence for a very long time. In the Rhodes Scholarship, students go to University of Oxford and spend two years, sometimes a little bit more than uh, two years, to study in their respective fields. So if you look at some of the uh, top uh, political leaders in the nation, um, many of them some of them got a Rhodes Scholarship, like Bill Clinton, he was a Rhodes Scholarship uh, fellow. So there are other uh, uh, leaders. You can easily you know, come across names like this. So Gates can, uh, uh, Scholarship was created by uh, the Gates, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates, um, just to, to have something equivalent to a Rhodes Scholarship, but it's in, uh, it's, uh, in Cambridge uh, University. So anyone who gets this scholarship, they can only go to Cambridge and the Rhodes Scholarship is only to, uh, you know, Oxford. They, have, they expect a very high GPA, Rhodes Scholarship you see 18 to 23. So right after their school, they capture the best and the brightest um, to go. And uh, so these two are pretty competitive. So one has to start preparing much earlier and focus on what you know, the student wants to do it and then uh, stay focused and collect world information, what's going around the world, all that. And the Gates Fellowship is mainly in the STEM field, but Rhodes Scholarship, you can choose what branch of uh, study, area of study 
you want to go. Then there is a Mitchell Scholarship, the Marshall Scholarship. Um, the Mitchell Scholarship is to go to Ireland, including Northern Ireland. The age is given. Again, this is restricted to US citizens. The Marshall Scholarship is a one to two year of study in UK, up to uh, 50 scholars per year in any field of study. Again, the GBA, GPA requirement is there and citizenship requirement is there. Then there is a one pain international development uh, um, fellowship. They give $90,000 over two years for graduate school. When the amount is not given, like in the uh, road scholarship, um, gate scholarship, it pretty much covers all the reasonable expenses. So 100% covered. It provides a unique pathway uh, to US, um, uh, US uh, um, AID foreign service. And uh, if you go to their website, this is what you find. If you want to work on the front lines of most pressing needs of the society, challenges of our time, poverty, hunger, injustice, disease, environmental degradation, climate change, conflict and violent extremism, you know, then go to work with USAID foreign service. So they have a GPA requirement and it's open to seniors and recent graduates. So the focus is international development. The one that I'm going to spend a, a significant amount of time is on the Fulbright Fellowship. So it's open to seniors and recent graduates, um, must be your citizen, and the GPA is 3.2. Now, this is a one you hear all the time, the Fulbright. What is the goal of Fulbright? It's to advance the mutual understanding between the people of US and other countries. This is a mission statement from Fulbright website. So the mission of Fulbright is the program, Fulbright program looks for individuals who exhibit the greatest promise of fostering the primary goal of the program, which is to advance mutual understanding between the people of the US and other countries. A little bit about background about the Fulbright because uh, next eight slides on Fulbright. So I might thought just to give you, introduce you what is a Fulbright. In 1945, uh, right at the end of the Second World War, the US had uh, lots of money they wanted to spend. So that time, Senator William Fulbright introduced a bill in US Congress to establish a program for the promotion of international goodwill through exchange of students in the field of education, culture, and science. Remember, this is at the end of the Second World War where I think something like 60 million people um, died because of the World War, Second World War. And uh, uh, they realized that we need to have um, international understanding of other countries, culture, people, and science. And so they came up with this Fulbright. In Truman's period, Harry Truman, he signed it and it was established in 1946. Since 1946, about 400,000 Fulbrighters um, have come and gone from over 160 countries. Approximately Fulbright hours about 8,000 fellowship every year. The alumni includes 40 heads of states of government, state government, state of government, the president, uh, the prime minister, and so on and so on. 61 Nobel laureates, 76 MacArthur Foundation fellows, 89 Pulitzer Prize recipients, and 16 US Presidential Medal of Freedom recipients to simply state that they are the best and the brightest the world can offer. And these are the, the highest awards we have in the world. In Fulbright, they have a, a bunch of program, but the most, uh, the one that we are talking about this one for students, 
they have this program. One is you go and study, uh, do a graduate study in another country. You go and conduct advanced research. You go and teach in some universities. You teach the primary, secondary school teaching worldwide. This is one of the major one, what they call ETA, English Teaching Assistant Scholarship. So they typically go somewhere between six months to 12 months. And uh, I will give you a little bit about the, the selection process and uh, what it takes and how you can think about start the, 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 the take the next step. So the purpose of the uh, Fulbright program, so there's a, this lot of stuff here, funding administration and all that. Um, but the purpose of the program uh, is threefold. To promote mutual understanding through a commitment to the free flow of ideas and people across national boundaries. To expand through his, his understanding the boundaries of human wisdom, empathy, and perception. The third, through cooperation in constructive activities among people of different nations to create true and lasting world peace. Now you can understand with what is going on in Ukraine, Russia conflict. This is uh, why this is so important now. Now the funding and administration, uh, the, if, you know, the funding is through um, US Department of State's Bureau of Educational, Educational and Cultural Affairs. And uh, this uh, um, administration of the Fulbright is done through IIE. Institute of International Education. And, um, you know, there's a Fulbright Commission and uh, they work with the US Embassy all over the world. Now, once you, you know, um, are ready, you submit your application, let's say ETA, the um, English Teaching Assistantship Program, that's called ETA. They have three, um, weighted categories. One is the grant purpose. The other one is qualification and background of the student. And the third one, personal attrib attributes and fit with the mission of Fulbright. So in the grant purpose, they give you this rationale and motivation of ETA grant. English language proficiency, um, qualification and background, they go through this. And the personal attributes fitted with Fulbright, Fulbright mission, like adaptability, flexibility, motivation, future plans, community engagement, advances diversity. So they go through this and then give a score of one to five. And so the next one you can see here, you submit for Fulbright. And there is a technical review that's what we call the NSC review. And, and then once it passes through the uh, NSC review, which is basically a screening to make sure all the documents are there, everything is in, in place. You have the reference letters, you have uh, you know the proposal that you, what you want to do, all those things are there, they go through and check and uh, basically to see if the application is complete. Then, it goes to the National Fulbright Screening Committee. And the National Fulbright Screening Committee includes typically three reviewers. So the three reviewers are, uh, so for you, you choose which country you want to apply, okay? In each country, they give you in the research area, they will say, okay, we are going to uh, take students in the environmental science, or we are going to take students to teach English in Turkey, all right? So if you want to do research in uh, uh, environmental science research, environmental science is a priority area for Turkey, all right? So you write the proposal saying that, you know, what you want to do, where you want to do, what you want to do, you know, when you want to do, all those, you establish a contact with the host institution, identify a university or an institute where you want to do it. 
if it is a teaching you choose the country where you want to go if you say oh, i want to teach english in turkey you know then you put in turkey i uh, saying that this the, i want to go to turkey you have to document um that you have put lot of uh, uh, leg work in terms of learning turkish language skill because you want to go to turkey not all people uh, speak english so how do you communicate so this kind of thing well in advance you start preparing towards that so then uh, the, based on the criteria this committee evaluates in a screen of 1 to you know scores in 1 to 5 so 5 is the best um you know so 3 is good 4 is very good and 5 is excellent so based on this we give a score each committee member gives a score and they add up all the scores and if you get 9 or i mean 3 3 score for you know 3 in each category and then if it is uh, total is maximum is 15 if you get 9 or above then likely this committee will pass it saying that okay this this student can go to the next stage so what, so then the you know, full bright will inform you saying that you are selected you are a semi finalist that's a quite a bit of an accomplishment right so once you get this it goes to the uh, uh, next stage and between january and april they send this application to the host country if you are chosen turkey the applications are sent to the fulbright commission in turkey so fulbright has always a bipartisan you know by, you know uh, uh, bilateral sorry bilateral that is the some of the funding is coming from turkish government some coming from the us government so when they select you the turkish government invest some money for you to do certain things to go and teach in some remote places in turkey all right so and they see how fit you will be in turkey and based on that they make the recommendation if you are recommended by us side you are recommended by turkish side there's a very good chance and then they look at how many uh, uh, you know how many uh, openings are there if they want 15 uh, etas in one year and then they will go through okay we got this and based on that they make the final list and then inform um saying that you got this uh, you got selected to full bright so that's how um it works so the committee members three committee members they they choose the, the those people who have worked in turkey as a full brighter so in my case i was in turkey so the three years we get application in one year we got like 65 application so the 65 application for all three awards for graduate studies eta english teaching assistant um so uh, and then um, you know uh, the research so graduate study to do research and the english teaching assistant all these three categories we go through and uh, uh, evaluate all right so the the evaluation also is quite rigorous you know the application is about 15 20 pages we go through read all those um prior to the meeting we put our score and then the comments you know why we put the score and all that and uh, uh, case by case we go through and discuss that's how the selection process works what all involved in the application process you you need a two letters of reference you need to submit your transcripts you have letter from the institution where you are going to work affiliation letter you, there is a foreign language form that is required um you know in certain cases the foreign language language may not be required i did not know turkish uh, a bit of turkish but i was going to a nuclear science institute in uh, um ismir and uh, so i was you know discussing with the uh, most of the work with the phd students and all that so language they speak uh, english so language was not required uh, in my case 
Then there's a campus committee evaluation form. We strongly recommend. So there is a campus committee at Wayne State. You meet with them and you, they interview you. And based on that, you write a letter. They write a letter that goes, uh, uh, that becomes part of uh, your uh, portfolio. They will read that letter. What's the campus committee evaluation says about this candidate? So all these things they take into consideration. What do we have at Wayne State? So the Office of Fellowships um, can help with you. So this is the website that's given. The Wayne State holds uh, live information sessions. So check uh, the events page in Wayne State. And the recordings of this session are posted online. They have a full session video as well as PDF of the slides. Um, you know, there is a, a form called intake form. So you start filling that form and submit it that shows the people in, in the office, OAP office, that you are really interested in this and they will reach out to you. You could apply during junior year for a fellowship, but junior year means when you are a freshman or a, or a first year, you need to start thinking about it. If you are a junior or even a senior, if you are not started thinking about it, no problem. You can start working on it, thinking about it, working on it now. You can apply next year. You know, I mean, this year is kind of late, I think. It is due sometime in August. And I think this is going to be kind of late. But you can start the work now as if you are going to do this year and submit it in next August. There are three dates to remember for the university. One is the campus, uh, campus start, date by which you should contact the fellowship office during the appropriate year. Then the campus decision date by which you need to submit your final application to the fellowship office. And then the scholarship deadline, this is rigid. So Fulbright has a, a, a deadline. If you don't submit, it doesn't get no extension, nothing. I think the most important thing is once you have this, um, if you are interested and you want to get, uh, um, you know, um, uh, more uh, um, information, I will be happy to work with uh, uh, any student, work with closely from the beginning to the end. And uh, the there is a statement of letter, and then they will say you know, one page, and then the one page where you talk about yourself, what motivates you to go to Fulbright. The theme, major theme is going to change the world. That has to come out of that letter, saying that I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, and this is how I will have a much bigger impact on the society. Always remember this. How, do you, how are you going to change the world? and prepare your application accordingly, what kind of changes you can bring the human society. Uh, so I would love to work with the students, you know, the 60 uh, application in one year, the other year some 45 and the, you know, another 40 or something. So we're talking about something like close to 150 applications uh, reading through over three years. You get a really good idea what the committee is looking for how to write a very successful um, Fulbright application. And uh, so I will be happy to work with uh, uh, any student. And I want uh, more students to get from Wayne State. It is a really a prestige to the university. I tell you that. There are universities all over the nation. They say, oh, we, are, uh, we get the highest Fulbright um, number of students going to Fulbright from our university, our school. And then they list that in the front page of the university saying that we want to get this. So if Wayne State can, can get to some uh, uh, really um, more students get involved, go on Fulbright, it would be really good for the university. All right. Um, some, so the concluding remarks, um, I think uh, the my Fulbright, um, uh, I think, let me just finish this with this one. I met a scientist in 2013. Um, 
uh, in an international conference. I was uh, co-organizing this conference. And then um, uh, this uh, researcher said, uh, you know, I would like to invite you to our university to give a series of talks. I said, okay, so that summer I went. And uh, before going there, I was just looking at uh, the name Ismail, trying to learn about the city, the location, and all that. And I came across, an, you know, the, in, 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 in my search, they put uh, Ismail written parenthesis as Smyrna, S-M-Y-R-A, R-N-A. And I was really fascinated uh, saying that, um, yeah, um, so I, I, I was fa very fascinated. And then I thought, you know, the Smyrna name is so familiar. Is it the saying Smyrna? Because in uh, uh, the Holy Scripture, in the Bible, uh, Smyrna is uh, one of the seven churches in the book of Revelation in chapter two and three. Uh, uh, Apostle John writes to different churches. So there, um, uh, you know, the church in Smyrna. And then it, it so happened that it's the same church, uh, uh, Smyrna, now they changed the name to Izmir when Izmir when uh, Turkey became a, a republic in 1924, and I said, "Oh wow!" You know, then all the seven churches were within about 50 mile radius. And I said, I told my host, "I'm coming back uh, for a longer time here." <laughs> so this was in 2013. So in 2015, uh, I went and uh, visited all these, uh, you know, many many biblical places. Even the death, uh, Mother Mary is buried in, uh, uh, you know, just outside uh, Ephesus. Uh, you know, so it's just a lot of historical, um, you know, the Christian influence in the first century, second century. And it's just a fascinating place. So I think that's uh, how I went as a full ride. Another second one is a question of, you know, one of my, uh, uh, my dear uh, one, uh, uh, once uh, made a remark, I got a full, full, you got a full break 36 years after me. Um, you know, she got at the age of 21 and you said, dad, you only got <laughs> 36 years after me. I said, so, but I think it, she also, um, her life, her, her world has changed tremendously after the Fulbright. Um, you know, she's writing not a lot of op-eds and, uh, you know, considered to be a leading expert in the African developing economy and all that, all kinds of things. So I think what the point is, it, uh, it can change the, uh, the whole, our worldview and also what we can do um, after Fulbright. So I strongly urge you to consider Fulbright. All right, so that is uh, all I have. Um, any questions you have? I have a question. That was awesome. Um, I know you said that if there are really no questions, uh, you can contact me by email. Uh, Mark, you know, I'll be happy to talk that, to that you. That is asking a question. Um, ben, can you, you hear me? The, uh, I, I was worried that you couldn't hear me because I have bad internet. I guess. Um, we are supposed okay. to get this. So Ben, go ahead and ask your question again. Yeah. Okay. Um, you said that it just has to be a country where they don't speak English. Is it really every country in the world? I mean, other than the English speaking ones. No, 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 no. I mean, it, uh, you can go to any country in the world where there's full, full break program is there. So almost they have in almost every country. I don't know about North Korea, uh, <laughs> but barring that uh, pretty much they have uh, um, full right in every country. So you can go, uh, the question is, uh, I don't know whether they have a Fulbright uh, English teaching ET, ETA in England, for example, or in Australia, or Canada. I'm not sure. Because uh, English is the primary language there. I need to check. I do not know. But you can pretty much uh, other countries. Also, if you want to get, uh, you know, what you want to do, if you want to do something, you also look at uh, the countries where you can make a bigger impact. Um, if, if, 
if if you want to go on a certain uh, pro, you know Fulbright program to France or the you know the developed uh, uh, Western economies, the competition is going to be much more intense. Mm -hmm. If you want to learn more about the um, you know the history like Ottoman Empire, you want to know much more about Ottoman Empire. They were you know ruling a significant fraction of the world. That's the longest uh, dynasty, I think, in human history, you know? Mm -hmm. Then, obviously, the best place is to go to Turkey. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right, Mark, that was awesome. Um, a lot of detailed information. The slide set is going to be saved, so everyone will be able to come back and revisit any of the slides that might help yeah. them if they're in interested at all in Fulbright. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we'd like to take a moment to also to talk about some other research opportunities and one that is kind of wrapping up right now, uh, but there's still some positions open that I, I, I they, they come in waves. So they, they come, um, I would say they start advertising their NSF REUs in December and getting your applications in at that time, but some of them still trickle in. So these NSF, these are research experience from undergrads. They're called REU programs. Wayne State has actually applied for a couple to host a couple REUs. I have a colleague that hosts an REU program in um, Athens, Georgia. And I had a student last year, two years, it was pre-pandemic. So I guess that's three years ago now. Um, he applied to like 16 of them. He got offered three and ended up taking one in New Mexico State University. These are often affiliated with a university and they almost always are, are a, a field station of some sort. And they are often also led by faculty and their grad students. They come in many disciplines. Um, I'm most familiar with the ones in biology and geosciences. So you can look for these. Um, there's, a, there's a website to go to, it's at the bottom of the page here. And that, the thing is that website's not even fully inclusive of everything there is. Literally, since Christmas to now, I've circulated probably 16 or 17 of them to one particular student because she told me a, a, one interest. A really good way to get on, to be aware of these is sign up for different blogs that post these um, all the time, but you can always just go into the REU website. The diversity of these experiences are huge. And a lot of the students who do these find that it is in the setting, it, in, in, in many research settings, where you're submersed in doing research with faculty, with graduate students, that many people find their pathway and network enough to, to get into a grad school, often with people that you may have done an REU with. So that, this is just one example. And I think, oh, Mark, you have to forward the next slide. I forgot you're, you're oh, in Yeah. Yeah. One second. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we got a lot, some of the faculty are out, some are unable to attend today. So we solicited information from other faculty. And this was some that um, I think Glenn Hood sent me. I'm almost positive. Um, these were ones that he saw were actually still taking applications for this summer. So there are a whole bunch of uh, research positions with places like the Department of Agriculture, the Environmental Protection Agency, Smithsonian, Department of Defense, Ecological Society of America. There's ones through all state and federal agencies. So if, if you want these types of positions, it just behooves you to like, just search, have, have time where you're spending going through through different opportunities. And I'm gonna move through these a little bit faster because um, we're running a little short on time and I wanna make sure Don gets to tell you about the internal programs too. Um, any question on any of these, the REUs or these uh, agency type positions? Is there any, yes, I'm sorry, um, oh, Dr. Cushion. Is there anything like that for graduate students? No, and the, there's a reason for that. there may be, but there's a reason why there wouldn't be. And part of that is that um, as a graduate student, you're usually doing your own research. 
However, I know I run the TRUST program over in biology. We do encourage students in that program to learn more interdisciplinary skills. And so for that, we look for summer internships. But anytime you're doing research and you also take an internship, you're taking, you're adding time to graduation at a at that level, because unless you tie it directly with your research, you're stepping away from your precious summer time to do your research and going out somewhere else. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. You know, sometimes you'll be doing something you're like, you know, I don't, I'm not sure if this is, even though you're in a program, you may be in it and think, well, maybe this wasn't exactly what I wanted to do. So taking a summer off and doing a research project somewhere else may, may be beneficial, but I'm not aware of any list of them. So it would be more like internships and people hiring. Um, REUs are specific for undergraduates, but there are still graduate programs that hire people for the summer and they, they don't care if you're an undergraduate or a graduate. So there is possibilities out there to look for those. And the application- oh, Thank you, I appreciate that. And the application process for all of these is a little bit different, but a huge recommendation right now for all of you, get to know faculty so they can write your letters of recommendation. The summer, the REUs require three letters of recommend. Yeah, I'm almost positive it's three letters of recommendation. It might be two. Um, and I know I have a letter of recommendation to write for a student today that I have to remember when we get off. And the other thing in, in your letters of recommendation, so get to know your professors. And the student, he, he asked me to write this letter and he felt so horrible. He's like, I already asked you to write one. Keep in mind, once a faculty writes a letter of recommendation for you, and, and Don can actually write letters to John can, they don't have to be faculty, people who know your interest and know your, your know you. Um, once you ask them to write that letter, they have that letter on file. Asking the second, third, fourth, fifth time is super easy. Like it's that first time that the faculty puts the effort into it. And then you just, the faculty, they're tweaking it from there on out. So don't ever hesitate to ask for letters um, because you, you're gonna need them, but you, you, gotta, you gotta get to know the faculty. Some faculty won't write you letters and, and if they don't know you. So go up after class. I know the pandemic has made it harder for you to do this. Um, but we're coming out of that and it's still, and the faculty is aware of the fact that you're usually a black box on the screen right now. Um, but those contexts are super important. Mark, do you wanna go to the next slide for me? Thanks. Um, so these were more, these were the, the specific REUs that uh, Glenn, Dr. Hood found that were still had opening. So just, if you have these, I'm, this will be posted. You'll have access to these links. And you know, every day things change, things open up, but things close. And then he also had this nice list of options for the National Association. Oh, you know what? These were from um, Scott. Uh, and he's on a field trip right now. Um, National Association of Geoscience Teachers. OK, next one. So some ecological jobs, these were coming from me. These, these are where to find blogs to get information. So for me, I, there are two sites I tell my students. The first one is it's called Ecolog. So the second half of the word at the very end of the link. Ecolog, it's a, it's a blog that you go to this website and you sign up and you get daily emails um, about the jobs. So this is where I see most REU posted. So remember I mentioned there's the REU website, but all the jobs are not there. Some faculty just are so familiar with the Ecological Society of America, they just post their jobs right to this page. There are jobs, I kid you not, that someone will say, I'm studying seals up in you know, Alaska and I need someone to help me tag seals. I've seen hyena ones that you know, go out, we're gonna be radio tracking hyenas. They are some of the coolest jobs. Of course, those are gonna be the most competitive, but you never know. And like I said that, my student um, a couple years ago got the job, he got three offers and took the one he was most interested in. And it was at a desert reserve. Um, he was super excited about it. More locally is Glynn. 
the Great Lakes uh, Information Network. These blogs do also have additional discussions. They may, um, they may talk about citizen science opportunities. They may post the latest research article. Ecolog um, at the, the top one also posts a lot about faculty positions. But if you follow these and just read them, it does something else, even if it's posting faculty positions, it, it shows you who's hiring and how they're hiring, what fields are getting the most hits, the wording they're using, and you're getting that lingo and a lot of expertise you don't even realize you're digesting. Um, Ecolog did have this one discussion that did seem to go on and on forever about the use of the word data and datum, whether it was singular or plural, and even that one burnt me out a little bit. But so there's there's some of that going on too. But again, these are the, the spots where that I direct my students to and we find the most jobs. All right, uh, Mark, did you wanna to go to the next one? Okay, so I'm gonna to go to on-campus opportunities now. So we're gonna hit a few on-campus ones. Um, do you wanna to go to the next one, Mark? I'm gonna go through these quick because I wanna make sure Don gets time here too. Europe. I, oh, almost every semester have a student getting a Europe award. A Europe award is an undergraduate research opportunities uh, program. They're at many universities. This is kind of like the internal REU program. So what the student does is you work with, you find a faculty, you work with them, and you write up a proposal. It's about two pages. I think they do it twice a year. So they have the spring, summer, and then the fall. If I remember right, the student gets $3,000, the faculty gets about $700. Um, you, you can write it. I've had cases where students did it on a topic I had very little knowledge of, um, but most of my students will do it on topics within my field of research. I sit on the review panel for these proposals. I almost never see one come in from an ESG student. And, and guess how many we funded on the last two rounds of the applicants? Guess how many we funded? What percent? 25. A hundred percent because we didn't get many applications. I think there was one, there was one lab, totally different department, totally different field where they maybe had like three applicants come in from the same lab and two of the proposals were very similar. I think we split that one. And that, that happens because students are working on similar projects, but they were 100%. It's not always 100%. I think applications dropped during the pandemic. But this last round, I have a student that just applied. We're waiting to hear back. It's going to be, it, it'll be over 70%, no doubt, that the majority of these will get funded. And, and I sit on the review panel. The most important thing is, oh my God, just follow instructions. If it says do this, then, then have a section that says methods. Um, that is one of the reasons most of the applications that don't come in don't get because most people are doing awesome research. Uh, Mark, do you want to switch to the next one? Barber, oh, the title didn't change on this one, but the Barber grant, that is another internal one. This one's cool. This one I have seen ESG students apply for and get. The, this, this one's got a little twist to it though. Um, the Barber one takes the faculty first. So the faculty makes an application saying, I want a barber student. And, it, and it's a partnering with two faculty in different departments. So I know Shirley had a barber student and she partnered with uh, Dr. Glenn Hood, which to us feels the same because we're all in environmental science, but they are technically two different departments. And so they got a student funded on barber, I think on the last round. And this money is coming in. Um, the applications have to be interdisciplinary. That is fundamental. They, they have to have an approach that is cross disciplines, which for us, I think is super easy to do. Um, and the last round, I think Barber's an individual, a wealthy individual. Um, he just ended up, the students that were funded, he felt because of the pandemic, they should be rewarded and dropped another semester of funding into those students' laps if they turned in their progress report. So you never know on things like this, how it's gonna go. It may create um, additional opportunities. So if you're interested in this, here's, there's a link right here um, and you submit an application when it opens up. 
Mark, do you want to move to the next one? I am going to hand it off to Don right now. Thank you, Don. And you're going to talk about studies that are open to you all the time in your own departments. Yeah, thank you, Donna. And it's great to see everyone here. So as you can see, there's many opportunities for research. And when I meet with you as the advisor, I'm always saying, you know, we want to make sure that we try to get you research internships. So it's great to hear about all these opportunities. One that we can actually do on campus is, as you can see here, what's called a directed study. Um, if you look at the undergraduate bulletin, there's a description of it. And it basically is, as you can see, that faculty work with students and they actually facilitate the research experience. So as a student, you get to develop your, your knowledge of what you're learning, your training, your skills in concert, right, with what you're studying, your environmental science, you know, studies. It's also primarily for students who wish to continue in a field or area that's beyond what's covered in your course, one of your courses that you've taken, or it could actually be a different, completely different topic, something that was not covered, you know, in your course. So, you know, you might be in a course right now and you're really interested in a particular subject, but you want to learn more. Or it might prompt you to think about something different that leads to other topics, okay? So that's what it's primarily, you know, for, is the directed study, to work with faculty, more or less one-on-one. -on -one. And if you click again, Mark. So if you are interested in the directed study, there is a few things that you need to do. First of all, it's for the student where you need to actually do a little bit of research first. You know, we want you to do research, but you don't want to just do research to do research. You know, yes, it looks good on an application or a resume, but you want to do something that you're interested in. Do something, you know, that you want to pursue. Now, this research that you do could be something that you want to then focus on for your career or for graduate studies, or it could be just a project that you're interested in. So what you first need to do is take a look at department faculty, right, professors and look at their faculty profiles, see what they're actually researching if you're already not familiar with it. And even if you kind of know what they're already researching, I encourage you to go to their department website, you know, look under people and then meet faculty. And then you'll see actually a description about their research, at least, you know, journal articles and so forth. You don't have to understand everything about that area of research. I think it's common for sometimes students to get a little bit overwhelmed or intimidated and they're not sure how to approach, you know, to even to ask a professor. But the first thing you do is just kind of look at what they're doing for research. Then you need to reach out to the professor, okay, and set up a meeting to talk to them. And this can be one of the hardest things for a student to do because they feel maybe a little awkward in doing so. And professors are used to it, okay? They encourage and they want students to come to them. So you want to ask a professor, perhaps it's an email, a brief email that says, you know, um, I'm in your class or I've seen your research and I see that you're studying such and such. And I'm really interested in, you know, learning about this. And perhaps, you know, if you have a, you know, we can briefly meet to talk about, you know, a possible research opportunity. Just kind of reach out to them and then you'll get a response. Now, some professors are currently doing projects. Maybe they have a grant for it. You know, maybe they have a graduate student that's doing some research and they're looking for another person or maybe not this semester, but maybe during the summer or in the fall. So reach out to the professors. That's what you need to do, right? After you do a little bit of research of what you wanna do and what the professor does. Then my recommendation would be, um, as you're gonna meet with them, and it's not like this formal interview or anything, all right? So, but you do wanna just kind of maybe make a list of questions that you'd have, you know, for that research professor. And that's nice to do because once you're actually meeting with them, whether it's in person or on Zoom, you know, or just talking to them, you know, maybe, um, it's nice to have a list of class uh, or, or after class. Um, it's nice to have a list of questions that you wanna ask them. And you might think that you'll remember these questions, you know, when you're talking to them. So you don't need to write them down. Sometimes you can get talking about one thing, you get excited and it goes to something else. And then at the end, you're like, oh, I never asked about this. So I recommend write down you know, a list of questions. But also, as I wrote here, be prepared to ask, answer a few questions, okay, about yourself. So in other words, if you wanna do something, a project, um, environmental science related, and you wanna compare something, and it might have some statistics involved in it, that professor may ask you, well, do you have any you know, um, statistical software experience? You know, 
Um, do you know SPSS or R, which is becoming more common, or do you have any Python or programming you know, experience? But you don't have to, okay? Don't be intimidated by that, but just be prepared, right, to answer some questions about yourself, okay? Um, also, ask questions when you're talking to the professor about research. I mean, it seems obvious, right? But, you know, if there's something that they say you're not entirely sure, ask them, you know, ask them if they could explain that again, or you didn't, you know, you understood this part, but, you know, clarify what they're saying if you're not sure, because that shows that you care, right? And that you have an attention to detail and you wanna know, right? So don't be shy about asking questions. Um, also, you know, definitely communicate with me, you know, as the advisor or other advisors about directed studies, we're there to help you. And then after you talk to the faculty, there's usually a form that you would fill out. So we can help you with that. Next slide. So this is just a quick overview. You're probably familiar with, you know, most of our professors, if not maybe all of them, um, in our environmental science and geology. So biology professors, geology, and you can see here, and they each have different areas of expertise or research. So again, you know, we encourage you to reach out to them. It doesn't mean that you have to just talk to one of them. You can reach out to two or three of them, right? And see what they have to offer and what best fits you, okay? The next one. So this is my last slide here. And it's just really quickly to show you that if you're interested in a directed study, you know, actual research with a professor, um, we can do those either in the biology department and that um, biology advisor, Kim Hunter, she assists with. There's actually a form that she will fill out with you for a directed study in the biological sciences. So as you know, we have environmental science professors that you know, have the biology there that you'd register for either the bio 4990, which is a one credit lecture. It's about an hour a week and you'd have to register for that. Just recently, the biology department, they modified and revised their directed study program. So you'd register for Bio 4990, just to kind of get an overview of what research is, research ethics, you know, how you do research and the logistics of it, of research itself. And then depending on how many credits you'd like to register for, for example, if you wanted two credits of research for the summer, then you'd register for Biology 4992, ending with a two for two credits. Typically, one credit of research equates to almost about three hours per week, but that can vary. That's decided between you and the research professor. Um, and it also depends on the scope of the project. If you're setting up a project or an experiment, it might take more hours that week. And then if an experiment's running, then it might take less. Um, we also have directed studies in under ESG, environmental science and geology, where you can register as you can see for either of those two classes. ESG 3990, which you'd register for either one, two, three, or four credits. And then we have the ESG 4860, which is primarily for um, honor students. And there's also honors research with a thesis, which is completely different, okay, than directed study. So overall, if you're interested in directed study, you register for the course after you talk with faculty. So I can't sign you up for it, right? You have to talk to faculty, make the arrangements, whatever the two of you decide. And then it's faculty that actually give the approval and then they let the advisor know. And then we have to process a registration override, which requires department approval for you to register. And then you can register, okay? So again, directed study is just one of the things on campus um, that we offer. And you can see there's many, many opportunities, right, for research. And Donna did mention this, and I'm sure Mark, you know, everyone will say, letters of recommendation are very, very important for jobs, for graduate school. So you wanna make those connections, you know, with professors. So we definitely encourage you to reach out to them. Next slide. So with this, we just want to give you all the opportunity to ask any additional questions um, on any of the programs and opportunities you might have heard of or anything we can help with. Do any of you have summer research set up already? I do. I've been doing the Barber research. Ah, 
Are you the one with uh, with uh, Shirley and Glenn? No, I'm with Dr. Huang in the engineering department. Oh, awesome. That's great. No, I, I feel like I'm in a very tricky position right now. I, I've reached out to a few faculty members and uh, I finally figured out. I know we had uh, spoke Dr. Cushion previously, but yeah, it, it's just kind of been, um, I'm not sure how this is going to work for the graduate because I'm assuming this all applies to undergraduate, right? The, the courses that uh, Don was talking about um, was for the undergraduates with the um, bio and ESG uh, direct study. Yeah, so you're absolutely right that most of the that these opportunities were largely undergraduates. Um, like I said, for graduate students, it's a bit different because your your personal research is usually what the research research experience is. But if I'm from your, are you doing a virtual program? Um, yeah, yeah, with the option of an MS, if I can find a thesis, if I can do a thesis component. Okay. So yeah, so that's where you would get your research is through the actual through the research. Um, graduate students doing an MA, the reason they're doing an MA is often because they're, they don't need or they don't, they're not going down the path of research per se. So the MA programs don't have a thesis and research program for them. We do have a series over, um, well, it's university-wide, the TRUS program, like I mentioned, that is graduate, that is specifically for um, graduate students. And so everything in those professional development seminars are tied to just, well, they're tied to, they're open to everyone, but they're tied to graduate students. We hadn't started recording them like we've been doing with these, which was a great idea, but we may have started with a few um, there are things like how to write interdisciplinary research publications um, and things like that. And we've wrapped up for the semester. But if you wanted to participate in those opportunities, um, I can direct you to my research manager, who's Darren, Dr. Darren Hunt, and he can put you on the list and we can share those brown bag opportunities with you. Yeah, and that would be great. Because <laughs> my, my dilemma right now was finding like I have things I'm interested in. My issue now is I'm trying to either do a direct study to complete a capstone or for an MA or do an MS. So either way, to be completely forward with you, um, I did an MA for a GPA booster and to get experience in environmental mm -hmm. sciences. I didn't take a lot of ecology courses and geology courses when my undergrad. So now I'm just kind of lost in direction, but I know I want to do research and I know I want to do ecology study. Okay. Uh, ecological studies. So it's, I know I'm going to go further with that. So it's just kind of that is finding the mentor is kind of where I'm at right now. Yeah, so that's really I did the same thing. So when I left my undergraduate, I was in I didn't I didn't have these opportunities to know I needed to do research. Um, and I didn't even know how to apply. So yeah. applying is, is there's tricks, you have to reach out to professors, which it sounds like you understand now. Um, and so I did, I took a statistics class at Michigan State, demonstrated, you know, got high grades in those classes and demonstrated I could do it. Um, and with that, applied again and finally did find a research position. So casting a wide net is helpful if you can apply, you know, far and wide if it's possible. Um, and yeah, speaking to professors is key to find a research lab that has space for you. Thank you. I appreciate that a lot. That is very helpful. All right. Any other questions? All right. Well, thanks all for joining us today. Um, and like I said, I will try and get this posted on the on the YouTube page that is accessible through Canvas. And I, I think, yeah, I think that's where it is. Don, is that correct? Are you still here? She may have had a jump. She's here. Yep, I'm here. Yep, we can post it on Canvas. Okay, cool. So I'll, I'll make a link send it in YouTube and send it over um, to make sure it's there. All right, with that, thank you all and everyone have a good weekend. I think Sunday is supposed to be warm again. <laughs> We're struggling to get there. How much? Did someone say a temperature? I thought I heard 71. Maybe yeah, that's... Mark said 71 and that trust yeah. him 100%. Wow.
I'll take it. I'll take it. All right. <laughs> Everyone have a good weekend. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye, Bye. everyone.